So uh, I'm going to talk about sea cucumbers. And uh, one of the, f uh, the animals so far that you don't really keep as a pet, I haven't heard of anyone keeping sea cucumbers as pets. Um, and so in Oceans Asia, we've been looking at shark fins for many years. And shark fins are considered one of the four treasures of Cantonese cuisine. Uh, the other three being um, abalone, fish maw, and sea cucumbers. And one of the concerns that we had was as efforts grow to reduce the consumption and trade in, sea, uh, in shark fins, that the demand for luxury seafood products would shift to other species. Um, and as you can see, um, all these species don't really look very appealing when they're in their, their, uh, their raw food form. Uh, but the idea was if we could get ahead of the trade in other species, we can then sort of stop this trade from happening as it shifts from shark fins to other species. Just as far as the idea of um, other neglected groups, I always find myself quite passionate about them. I always have to uh, get talked down from launching a large-scale research project on, on krill or, or giant clams or Patagonian toothfish. So I think perhaps um, other people who are attending will agree with me that there is a certain appeal to, to really getting to know a, a species that is less well-known. But before I jump into sea cucumbers, I did want to sort of contribute to the overall conversation about neglected groups and why we're looking at them. And, you know, this is, I think, something that's going to come up a lot during the symposium. But overall, you know, you have the, the challenges of species like a sea cucumber, which, uh, as you can see, hold on here. There we go. Um, you know, they're, they're not charismatic, which makes them difficult to promote. And I think it's already been mentioned, and you'll see some pictures and some videos in a few minutes that kind of demonstrate the, the challenges of marketing sea cucumbers in an attractive way. And one of the other challenges you have is that in addition to doing general advocacy, you also have to educate people as to what the species is. You know, the first question that people ask is, is a sea cucumber a vegetable? No, it's an echinoderm. Um, but, you know, the fact that you have to do this extensive education before you can even talk about the conservation impacts means that you have more work cut out, to you, out, cut out for you. And that, that goes for the public and it goes for law enforcement as well. And on top of all that, this makes it difficult to attract funding and support from the members of the public. Um, the pictures of the cheetahs were adorable, but the pictures I'm going to show you of sea cucumbers, though I think they're adorable, um, have a much more limited appeal. But there are some benefits, right? So the positive benefits are that there is an urgent conservation need and that many of these species play really important roles in ecosystems. And if we're able to protect them, we can have all those concomitant benefits to the ecosystems. On top of that, you have the catch-up effect, right? If there's no conservation being done on a species, small pieces of legislation and small uh, efforts can have a huge impact in protecting that species. And critically, um, there's less attention being given, but that can also be seen as a beneficial thing because the individuals who are trading in these species are less careful, right? Whereas someone who's trading in um, a highly regulated species may be... Um, may run their a more clandestine operation. With things like sea cucumbers, they might be more overt, which makes our job a lot easier. When it comes to solutions, one of the things I've noticed, and I think we'll hear a lot during the symposium, is the idea of framing less attractive species as, um, as a form of crime, as opposed to um, you know, other, other framing as opposed to like moral, moral framing. And one of the things that I'm very passionate about is framing them as a form of organized crime. As I'll show you in some examples with sea cucumbers, we aren't just talking about individuals opportunistically you know, fishing an echinoderm from the ocean. We are talking about highly sophisticated organized networks. So when people think about organized crime, they too often think about the mafia from televisions and from Hollywood, but they don't think about um, organized wildlife trade. And if we can change people's minds about that and convince the authorities that this is legitimately a form of organized crime, which it is, we can get more resources and attention towards it. And one of the things I've noticed a few people have already done, and I'm, I'm sure we'll do a lot more, um, is contextualizing, right? So people just don't understand, members of the public just don't understand how valuable things are. Um, one of my favorite examples here is caterpillar fungus. This sells for $140,000 a kilogram. Um, compared to the gold sales yesterday was about $60,000 a kilogram. So it is much more expensive. Um, and again, that's more expensive than heroin or cocaine either. And so if you're able to contextualize those information for the public, it can be more compelling. Um, this is, for example, a fish maw that uh, we found in Singapore a few years ago. This single fish maw, about 300 grams of fish, is being sold for 98000 Singapore, which is the price of a sports car for a chunk of fish you could carry in your pocket or your purse. So let's talk sea cucumbers. Uh, this is a giant red, uh, Pacific red sea cucumber. Uh, there's about 1,700 species of Holothuria that have been described. 
they're basically the earthworms of the sea. Now, I'm not going to apologize for this, but the next scene you're going to see as I talk is one of the best videos of a sea cucumber doing what it does best. This is a sea cucumber bioturbating. So they eat sand um, and they cycle it through, and this is an integral part of the nutrient cycle. So this, this reduces the organic load and redistributes surface sediment. It, uh, the inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus that they excrete, which it's about to excrete right about now, there we go. Um, this is really important for enhancing the benthic habitat um, and for bioremediation. Also, there's been a lot of research done recently around sea cucumbers um, improving alkalinity of the ocean, which is really important to reducing ocean acidification. So they have a really important role in ecosystems. And here's a great video of one doing it now. And so sea cucumbers uh, range in size from very small to up to six feet long. This is um, a couple examples here of what they're used for. So they're primarily as a food source. Oh, a couple more things on their the ecology. They have sort of complex symbiotic relationships with other species as well. Um, if you know anything about a sea cucumber, you'll know that a certain species of sea cucumber has a pearl fish that decides to live in its anal cavity. Um, so they're, they're fascinating species that are very weird, if, um, if I can put it that way, which means communicating around them both fun but also a challenge because there's there's sort of a trivial fun nature to them but the crime around them is very serious. Uh, so sea cucumbers are primarily used for both food and as traditional Chinese medicine and they're sold either dried or canned or uh, frozen or extracts of them are sold. And the price of sea cucumbers has been going up steadily. So in the 1960s it was about three dollars a kilogram, the 80s it was sixty dollars a kilogram, and in the 2000s, we're looking at about $300 a kilogram. Um, this is some shots that my colleague Gary took in Hong Kong in November. And so we're looking at about uh, three to you know, $200 to $300 for a kilogram of the species that we're likely to see in um, India and Sri Lanka. Um, however, the most expensive are the Japonicus. That was actually that um, this one over here. These will sell for $3,500 a kilogram. And the most expensive tropical species are $1,800 a kilogram. Uh, the, the species in Sri, um, India and Sri Lanka, which I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk, tend to range um, a bit lower around the three dollars to $400 mark. Here's us doing some of our investigative work in, um, in, in, in Singapore. Uh, one of the fascinating things that I'm always kind of confused by is these are a luxury food product, but they will dry them directly on the surface of the road in Hong Kong. This is a shot from a, a few years ago from one of our, our projects. And those are you know, expensive sea cucumbers drying on the road of Hong Kong. So turning quickly to India and Sri Lanka then, um, there's a long history of trade, particularly in this region, over a thousand years of trade between um, Arab and Chinese traders. And the principal areas are here in the Gulf of Manar and Palk Bay, um, the space between Sri Lanka and the southern tip of India. We have a disparity in laws. So in India, sea cucumbers have been, um, you, you cannot fish or trade in sea cucumbers since 2001. They're schedule one of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Um, whereas in Sri Lanka, uh, they, uh, the southern part of the island has basically been sort of, the commercial trade has been stopped and commercial fishing has ended because of uh, production and species numbers. Uh, whereas the northern part is where we tend to see most of the fisheries and individuals are able to fish sea cucumbers but they require licenses for various numbers of things. And there's been an effort by the government to reduce the numbers in the past few years. Um, one of the challenges we get is that with these two disparities of laws, and I think this I think echoes really well with the previous presentation, um, is that um, you know, this allows for sea cucumbers that are poached in India to be then smuggled into Sri Lanka, laundered, and then introduced into Southeast Asian markets. There is no really domestic consumption of sea cucumber in India and Sri Lanka. So the two primary forms of crime that we see are poaching and smuggling. There's a lot of other associated crimes, but we don't get reports of those. Uh, presumably, most of these people are also dodging taxes and possibly engaging in unsafe fishing practices as well. Um, and there's a lot of instances of species being smuggled together. Um, so just two days ago or yesterday, there was a case in Hong Kong where um, 183 kilograms of shark fin were seized with uh, half a kilogram of uh, seahorses. And the day before that, there was uh, sea cucumbers being poached with other species as well. So what we went about doing is we created a database of sea cucumber crime using news media sources and government reports and uh, from 2015 to 2020. 
we I'm trying to get a hold of the police report so I can do some more detailed research, but at the moment, this is what we could get. Uh, that was 120 incidents, 50 in Hong Kong, uh, 50 in India, 70 in Sri Lanka, an overall of two, uh, 502 arrests, averaging four per incident, which means that more than four people are involved in operations, which in my mind makes these organized crime. Um, more than two people make something an organized criminal operation. And the ages of individuals involved are between 15 and 63. Um, I was kind of surprised that the Indian media would report <laughs> information about uh, underage uh, criminals, but uh, there you have it. Uh, just a couple limitations about our work, and I'm sure other folks have encountered this trying to do research during COVID. Uh, we were using English media sources, so we may have missed some content. And one of the challenges with reporting is that the police will often report a number of sea cucumbers or value seized. Uh, we don't have any idea of how they calculated the value. The values varied dramatically and didn't reflect market prices. And the numbers were also varied considerably. You know, what is three kilograms of sea cucumber? Is it wet? Is it dry? When you dry a sea cucumber, it goes down to about 8% of its volume. So it's, there's a significant difference there. Um, and so you know, these are also challenges I'm sure other folks have encountered. And there's also the concern of in reporting the value of seizures that you actually market the industry to people who are looking to get involved uh, because suddenly they realize how expensive sea cucumbers are which maybe entices them into the industry. So more of a pull factor than a push factor from one of sort of criminological perspectives. Um, so when we did our analysis, we, we mapped them out, 120 incidents, and we can see some interesting trends. So these are our trends over time. Yellow dots are 2015, the, the green are 2020 with variability between them. And what we notice is that you do have a core over here in the, the heart of the, the main sea cucumber fishing areas but then we see uh, the, the trade spreading over here to Lakshwadeep, um, only just this year, really, apart from one outlier. And this is fascinating because it reflects a trend known as the roving bandits approach to resource extraction, wherein uh, groups will begin to fish further and further away from their core as local sources are depleted. And it's sort of a form of, of serial exploitation. One population is extirpated and the, the, the bandits and poachers move on to another location. It's very common, but mapping out these cases has allowed us to sort of track a very obvious trend of sea cucumber crime moving into Lakshwadeep. Twelve minutes still. Perfect. And you can kind of see that the, the main cluster here and a zoomed in section of Lakshwadeep there. So just quickly breaking down the numbers, uh, over the past five years, we've had 64.7 metric tons. It averages about 544 kilograms per seizure. This is a total of 100,000 uh, more or more sea cucumbers, about 800 or more per incident. And the value, again, is very hard to calculate, but we estimate about two point, at least 2.8 million, and that's 23,000 per incident. But we should note that there's a considerable variability. There's one case that was almost half a million dollars of sea cucumber, and another was $26. So it, it varies considerably. But you can see when you map out these incidents, the number of incidents, there's been a massive increase in recent years, which reflects an increase in attention by the authorities um, and also potentially an increase in the number of sea cucumber crimes occurring. Um, similarly, um, we have the number of arrests are also have also been going up. And, um, and, and, and um, the values of seizures as well. Um, so what's very interesting here is that the authorities have dramatically increased their policing, um, or at least the number of arrests they've been making, and that's had a concomitant impact on scale of seizures. And again, uh, the bane of my existence, which is trying to figure out um, wet and dry values and <laughs> to, to, to get raw numbers, you can see sort of the differences here around um, wet and dry seizures. And so just sort of to wrap up, one of the things that we found with our ongoing work, and, and by the way, this is um, forthcoming in a publication in the Best Mare Bulletin, so look for that soon, um, is that you have a large scale. So there's a lot of sea cucumber poaching taking place it's highly organized. So we're not just talking about individuals opportunistically gleaning a couple of sea cucumbers from the beach, but rather we have warehouses that collect thousands of sea cucumbers over months and then smuggle them out of the country. There was drop sites with lookouts. Um, one thing I was quite astounded by was the sheer number of people who were evading the police when, they, um, when there's an incident because they have lookouts and, and control systems. Um, again, we've noted the traditional smuggling routes, but the expansion to other areas like Lakshwadeep is of concern. And that does suggest the sort of roving bandit syndrome. But there's been some progress. So um, India 
has um, created a sea cucumber protection task force. They've set up anti-poaching camps in Lakshwa Deep. They actually created the first sea cucumber conservation reserve in Lakshwa Deep. And what's very important from my perspective is they've started assigning cases to the Central Bureau of Investigation, which is their Indian um, uh, police force that deals with serious crime and interstate crime. So they're beginning to treat this issue as a form of transnational organized crime, which in my mind reflects the nature of, of, of the trade. There's just a couple of news headlines from the past where we have um, in the case in the United States where a drug smuggling operation was using it as a sea cucumber trade as cover. The Yakuza are selling sea cucumbers in India, in Japan rather. Um, there's some coverage of one of our stories. Um, and we have individuals in other countries engaged in this form of transnational crime. What's important, what, well, I guess the final takeaway I would make is that, and this is coming up a lot in the symposium, is cooperation is really key, right? Not just interstate cooperation, but interagency cooperation, particularly in places where you have two countries where there's a very definite uh, trade route. Um, and what's interesting here is the low profile nature of sea cucumbers means that cooperation is easier. There's less attention, there's less high pressure, interagency cooperations, um, it's more possible, which I think is important because it allows for, uh, <laughs> It allows for, for more effective cooperation rather than sort of the bureaucratic um, mechanisms getting in place. We definitely need more enforcement. I do like the RAID uh, acronym. I might start using that with <laughs> to credit you with that one. I think it's it's apt. We definitely need more enforcement and, and punishments. And again, training to identify species. Uh, when the police sees species, I haven't seen a single report of the actual species identified. It's just sea cucumber. But some cu sea cucumbers are worth a couple of dollars a kilogram, and some are worth thousands of dollars a kilogram. And the police need to know the difference so they can you know, record these, but also so that has an impact on punishment and crime. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to people's uh, questions and comments by email. 